Many people have asked me the question, is the highway code actually law? And you might be forgiven for wondering this, because code to some people suggests that it's just some kind of guidance that you may or may not have to comply with, and that it might just be how you should behave when you're driving a car, riding a motorcycle, or in fact walking around on the streets. So in this video, I hope to help you understand how the highway code fits in with legislation, what the consequences might be of breaking parts of the highway code, and hopefully give you some sort of definitive answer as to whether or not the highway code is in fact law. But first of all, if you're new to me on this channel, welcome, I'm a barrister who helps you understand law. So hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so you don't miss out on future videos. Your questions might find their way onto a video here or on my sister channel, Black Belt Secrets, linked below. So the highway code, I suspect, is something that everybody becomes familiar with when they are taking their driving test and possibly never look at again until it comes up as a trivia question as to whether or not something is permitted, required, or legal on the road. I would like to think, and I would certainly encourage everybody to remain familiar, in fact you are required to remain familiar with the rules of the road contained within the highway code, as a duty to other road users. Remember duties are placed upon us throughout our daily lives, and one of the duties upon you for using the road is knowing the rules and complying with those rules. But as to whether or not they are hard and fast law, it is important to look at the wording in the code. As with many things in law, there are specific words that are used which will denote mandatory obligations and which are very often and usually backed up by law. And the same is true for the Highway Code. Throughout many of the rules in the Highway Code, there are words used such as you should do this, you should do that. But many others, as you read through, you will notice they will say you must do this or you must not do that. The wording is very specific, and it's used for a reason. For example, if a rule says that you should do something, but in fact you didn't, and you're being prosecuted for something else, that might be taken into consideration as to whether or not you were guilty of the other offence charged, just because this is a rule contained within the Highway Code. However, many of the other rules are legal requirements, meaning if you disobey any of these rules, you may be committing a criminal offence, and there will be a range of punishments attached to it. For example, fines, points on your licence, being disqualified from driving, or in the worst cases, you may even be sent to prison. So you can identify these rules that are backed up by legislation because they will have the wording you must or must not do a thing in a certain place at a certain time or in a certain way. And I'm going to go through some examples. And very often each rule will contain an abbreviation to a piece of legislation, and there is also an explanation given as to all these abbreviations of different legislation that is used throughout the Highway Code, backing up those rules by way of hard and fast law. So just before we look at some examples, remember just because a rule may not say must or must not within the wording, whilst breaching that rule may not in itself cause you to be prosecuted, it may well be used as supporting evidence in another prosecution if you've breached those rules. So whilst they themselves might not be backed up by legislation, they will certainly be used if necessary. And you'll probably be pleased to know that the Highway Code applies to everybody that is using the road, whether you are in a car, on a cycle, a motorcycle, walking, driving a lorry, riding a horse, or any other kind of vehicle, including wheelchairs and powered wheelchairs. So taking as one of my first examples the powered wheelchairs and mobility scooters. Rule 37 of the Highway Code is of the should variety, and reads, when you are on the road, you should obey the guidance and rules for other vehicles. When you are on the pavement, you should follow the guidance and rules for pedestrians. However, contrasting that with Rule 39, which is a rule that is backed up by legislation, and you will see the abbreviation beneath it. This reads, powered wheelchairs and scooters must not travel faster than four miles per hour on pavements or in pedestrian areas. And you can see the abbreviated reference to the law, the UICHR 1988 which stands for the Use of Invalid Carriages on Highways Regulations 1988. In addition, and clearing up the question as to whether powered wheelchairs and mobility scooters are required to follow the traffic lights and use indicators just like other road users, this is covered by Rule 43. You must follow the same rules about using lights, indicators and horns as for other road vehicles if your vehicle is fitted with them. At night, lights must be used. 
Looking briefly at pedestrians, most of them are guidance, but Rule 6 says pedestrians must not be on motorways. And Rule 16 comes along with a bit of a story, which says that you must not get onto or hold onto a moving vehicle. This is from the Road Traffic Act 1988, section 26. And the story goes like this. Between the age of about 18 and 21, I was a voluntary police officer. We had a call come in that there was a bunch of kids on the bus and we needed to go and sort them out. So we turned the car around and we headed into town. We asked over the radio what the kids were doing so we'd have some idea of what to expect when we got there. The response came back, they are on the bus. So our response went back and said, yes, they're on the bus, but what are they doing? To which another response came back and just said, they are on the bus. At which point we went back yet again to clarify, do you mean they are physically on the bus? And that was in fact what had happened. These kids had climbed onto a bus shelter and then climbed on top of the bus as the bus pulled up. Monumentally stupid and dangerous, but that's the call that we went out to. And as you can see, it is a must not rule in the highway code backed up by the Road Traffic Act 1988. An example with horse riders is rule 54. You must not take a horse onto a footpath or pavement, and this is backed up by the Highways Act of 1835, section 72. Moving on to cyclists, there's been a lot of debate as to whether cyclists should or should not, must or must not have lights fitted when riding at night. This is cleared up by rule number 60. At night, your cycle must have white front and red rear lights lit. It must also be fitted with a red rear reflector, whereas the white front reflector appears to be additional guidance. Also, cyclists must not cycle on the pavement. This is in rule 64. Also, as many people have asked me before, cyclists must also obey traffic light signals, and this is in rule 69. You must obey all traffic signs and traffic light signals, and this is in the Road Traffic Act of 1988, section 36. And if that wasn't clear enough, rule 71 goes further. You must not cross the stop line when the traffic lights are red. Some junctions have an advanced stop line to enable you to wait and position yourself ahead of other traffic. Most of you should be familiar with that small section right in front of the traffic lights that often has a cycle printed on it. This is where cyclists must stop, and it would be an offence if they fail to do so. That means cyclists, you cannot just get to a red light and then ease your way through because you think it's easier, you think it's quicker, and you don't want to wait for the traffic lights. As a responsible cyclist, both for yourself and for other road users, you must absolutely stop at traffic lights, and you cannot just go through that solid line if the lights are on red. And on numerous occasions, I have seen cyclists get to a red light and then instead ride onto the pavement and go around the corner and carry on their journey. This is also not permitted. As I said earlier, cyclists must not ride on the pavement. Although it should be said, if you get to junctions and roundabouts, you can dismount and then walk your cycle around on the pavement, cross the road, and then carry on. For example, if you get to a large roundabout and you think it's too dangerous to ride your cycle around it, you can dismount and walk around. That is outlined in rules 76 to 78. Moving on to some examples for vehicles, some people wonder whether or not it is an offence to get out of your vehicle whilst the engine is still running. This is in rule 123. It is a must not leave a parked vehicle unattended with the engine running or leave the vehicle engine running unnecessarily while stationary on a public road. And this is backed up in law by the Construction and Use Regulations 98 and 107. And addressing the question as to whether a car can park on the pavement and whether it is an offence. Rule 145 of the Highway Code provides you must not drive on or over a pavement, footpath or bridleway except to gain lawful access to a property or indeed in the case of an emergency. In other words, if you're not driving onto your driveway, you should not be driving onto the pavement even for a few seconds. Another rule about parking on the pavement, Rule 244 states you must not park partially or wholly on the pavement in London and should not do so anywhere else unless signs permit it. But obviously driving over the footpath, as I've said, is an offence everywhere else. And rule 144 is a very interesting one because it has a very wide ambit. And it states you must not drive dangerously, drive without due care and attention, or drive without reasonable consideration for other road users. 
and this is in the Road Traffic Act 1988, sections 2 and 3, as amended in 1991. Now, driving dangerously and driving without due care and attention, I've addressed in other videos. These might amount to simply doing something else whilst you are driving and not paying attention to the road, which might amount, in the mind of a reasonable and competent driver, to be dangerous. However, the rule that you must not drive without reasonable consideration for other road users comes into play when discussing road rage. This is known as a CD20 offence, driving without reasonable consideration for other road users. This might even be if you are raising your hands in anger, using hand gestures, flashing your lights out of frustration, blasting your horn out of frustration, or generally showing aggression in that way. This might well amount to an offence under that section. This might attract three to nine penalty points on your licence, which obviously if it tops up to 12 points, which doesn't take very much, the court will be obliged to ban you for a minimum period of six months unless you can show exceptional hardship, which might well be difficult and being inconvenient to get to work is not going to work as an excuse. It's going to have to be a much more serious argument and genuine exceptional hardship, which very often needs to relate to somebody else. Other things you may not realise are mandatory, for example, Rule 147. You must not throw anything out of a vehicle, for example, cigarette ends cans, paper, or carrier bags. And also rule 148, the driver must not smoke or allow anyone to smoke in an enclosed private vehicle carrying someone under 18. In other words, it's been decided that smoking in a vehicle with children, which is anyone under the age of 18, is simply not acceptable. Also clearing up cars parked facing the wrong way on the side of the road. We've all seen it, and rule 248 provides you must not park on a road at night facing against the direction of traffic flow unless in a recognised parking space. Additionally, with rule 249, if the speed limit is above 30 miles per hour, all vehicles must display parking lights when parked on a road or lay-by. Obviously, there are lots of rules that I haven't covered here, but remember, just because something might not be a must or must not, it might be something that is considered in connection with any other kind of offence, be that inconsiderate driving, driving without due care and attention, or dangerous driving. Breaching any of the rules in the Highway Code can and usually will be used to support such a prosecution. And of course, this will be particularly prevalent if it is a must or must not rule which you have breached, which is backed up in law, because they will be separate offences in and of themselves. So I hope you found this to be a useful refresher on understanding the highway code and how it applies in law. Remember to hit that like button if you found it useful and remember, stay humble and subscribe.